I'm going to talk about the diastolic heart failure. In the short period of time, I'll try to sort of go through the definition, the clinical presentation, the prevalence of this condition, the patient profile, the outcome, and then the management. Now the definition, this is a clinical syndrome characterized by the symptoms of and signs of heart failure, uh, a preserved ejection fraction, and the definition of that really varies in the literature in different papers, an abnormal diastolic function. The Mayo Clinic recently came up with a suggestion that I think we all should adopt, and, and this is the ejection fraction really has to be at least 50% because patients with ejection fraction between 40 and 50% that have been included in some of the studies really behave more like systolic dysfunction. Now, I'm not going to go through the uh, diagnostic criteria. I understand it was reviewed yesterday by one of the speakers. We have a uh, large number of echocardiographic criteria. But interestingly enough, if you're looking at this paper from the Mayo Clinic, looking at a large number of patients with heart failure and diastolic dysfunction. So many of these patients do, and many of these patients do not have some of the characteristic echocardiographic manifestation, which we call signs of, heart, of diastolic heart failure. So diastolic dysfunction diagnosed by echocardiography is common, but often is not accompanied by symptoms of heart failure. So because of that, Really, I think uh, we came up with a practical definition that can be understood by everybody taking care of patients with heart failure. And this is that diastolic heart failure is defined now simply as the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And now the abbreviation is half puff. This is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction versus the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So this is the definition in the guidelines and the definition in most of the literature. What is the prevalence? The prevalence is fairly high. So if a patient walks into your office or to the hospital or to the emergency department with signs and symptoms of heart failure, then about 50% of this patient will have preserved ejection fraction. So it's very common that patients with heart failure do not have systolic dysfunction. The clinical characteristics are shown on this slide. It is unique in the sense that it's seen more commonly in women. It is definitely a disease of the elderly. So the older people get, the more likely, almost by definition, for the ventricle to develop diastolic dysfunction. It is more common in patients who have a history of hypertension. And the patient have less coronary disease and myocardial infarction as a cause for a heart failure. Normal versus increased left ventricular and diastolic volume. So this is the patient, uh, these patients will have actually small ventricles and thick wall. And then there are some characteristic uh, histological differences between uh, preserved and reduced ejection fraction. And then the, uh, one of the really most disturbing differences between these two entities is that we have not been able to apply the same therapy that really has been successful in the reduced ejection fraction to the patient with preserved ejection fraction. And I'm going to talk about management, and you're going to see it's going to be the shortest part of the presentation. Now, what is the clinical presentation? So if somebody walks into the hospital, can you guess? And the answer is no, because the clinical presentation is very similar. People come with the symptoms of heart failure. They may have edema, the autopnea, and the PND. It is very difficult really to differentiate when you're just looking at the patient in the emergency department unless the patient has on chest x-ray a normal sized heart. And oftentimes it's not the case at the bedside as you know. So you really have to do an echocardiogram to differentiate between these two conditions. Now, I mentioned yesterday that the BMP, and I did not get a sense of how widely is this used here in India uh, as a marker for heart failure. We're using it almost routinely, probably too often. But nevertheless, if you're applying BNP in patients with diastolic dysfunction for the same degree of heart failure, the BNP level is going to be somewhat reduced 
And this is because of the fact that the BNP is stimulated by the wall tension. And when you have a small heart and a thick ventricle, a thick wall, then obviously the wall tension is reduced compared to somebody with a large heart. The wall tension is proportional to the diameter and reversely proportional to the thickness of the wall. So overall, although there are individual variations, the BMP sometimes is, is at the mid-range. And the echocardiogram or any other modality which is going to look at the volume is going to give you the diagnosis. This is here systolic heart failure, diastolic heart failure. You see the difference in left ventricular and diastolic volume. The ejection fraction obviously is normal here and markedly reduced in the patient with reduced ejection fraction. So to summarize the differences between patients with reduced and preserved ejection fraction who present with heart failure, the clinical presentation is virtually the same in these two groups. However, these two conditions have substantially different uh, uh, phenotypes and pathophysiology. There are differences in the epi epidemiology, the cellular, the extracellular, molecular structure and function, as well as the response to pharmacological treatment. Now, the mechanism of exercise intolerance, which is very common in this patient, they present with shortness of breath, especially exertional, and they have limitation of exercise capacity. And Dr. Paulus, one of the most actually renowned investigator in diastolic dysfunction, he says it's probably a multitude of, uh, of reasons Decrease in relaxation, obviously, that causes uh, diastolic dysfunction and change in the pressure in relationship to the volume. And then you have the chronotropic incompetence. And this is a phenomenon that the, this patient walking on the treadmill or walking period are not able to increase the heart rate to meet the demand. And that's part of the reason why they get tired, they get short of breath. There's endothelial dysfunction decrease in systolic function. So in this patient that have normal ejection fraction, there is a, uh, an evidence that the systolic function is actually not necessarily or completely normal. So at the end of the day, he says, a steep diastolic left ventricular pressure volume relation, relation remains the uncontested leader of this gang, of this basically potential mechanism. And those of you who are familiar with the uh, volume pressure curve, uh, this is a display here of a normal pressure volume curve. And you can see here that as the volume increases here on the horizontal axis, there's a change in pressure. This is normal. Uh, this is a patient's, I'm sorry, this is a patient with systolic dysfunction. This is a normal individual. And here you have a patient with diastolic dysfunction. The difference is that the ventricle is so stiff and does not tolerate the volume. So for a given volume, a similar amount of volume shown in the normal situation, there is a, uh, an increase in pressure to the point that the patient obviously uh, has shortness of breath. You can see this line here, very similar to the patient with systolic function. This uh, basically interval here represents the stroke volume. And the stroke volume in patient with systolic dysfunction obviously is diminished uh, for a reason. And here, diastolic dysfunction, in, st in spite of the fact that the ejection fraction is maintained because of the restricted filling to the left ventricle, at one point you also have decrease in stroke volume and cardiac output. So it's an interesting, actually, relationship. And in, uh, 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 basically, an elegant study demonstrating that uh, for a given increase in heart rate, you see here that the wedge pressure in patients with diastolic dysfunction is rising very quickly. Although in the patients with normal ventricle, if the patient keeps going, and the heart rate keeps going up, the, uh, the uh, wedge pressure, the filling pressure within the left ventricle will, will increase to the same extent. This happens in patients with diastolic dysfunction early and quickly, and because of that, the shortness of breath this reflection of the pressure from the left ventricle into the lungs, and the patient becomes short of breath. So that's uh, one of the mechanisms that we're trying actually to counteract in the treatment of this condition.
Now, what is the uh, outcome? Uh, interestingly enough, if you're looking at patients with preserved ejection fraction and patients with reduced ejection fraction and looking at the survival, it is almost the same. It is almost the same. So seeing somebody walking into the office with heart failure and the ejection fraction is normal is not necessarily an indication for a good outcome. The difference, however, is that the cause of mortality and morbidity is different. And there is a reduced, actually, mortality from coronary artery disease compared to the patients with, with reduced ejection fraction. There's a higher incidence of comorbidity that is non-cardiac that eventually leads to poor prognosis. And remember, many of these patients are elderly and have comorbidity. Another phenomenon that has been now shown by the Mayo Clinic group, which I think will have some therapeutic implication, is the very high incidence of pulmonary hypertension in this patient population. There's an increase in left ventricular and diastolic pressure reflected into the left atrium, reflected into the pulmonary circulation. So initially you have what we call venous hypertension, and eventually because of changes in the vasculature, it turns into arterial pulmonary hypertension. And this is very common. And you can see here, uh, this is the, the pulmonary artery systolic pressure in hypertensive, so it's approximately 20 or about 30. And you see the shift of the curve in the patient with diastolic dysfunction. The incidence of pulmonary hypertension, as defined in this study, I think it was 35 millimeter of mercury, is 83% in this patient population. Very, very common, uh, obviously a point that we need to address and see whether this can become a therapeutic target. Uh, this is also affecting mortality. And you can see here that the patient with uh, a uh, pulmonary artery pressure over and below 48, 48 millimeter of mercury, a very substantial difference in mortality uh, in a very small p-value. So how do we manage this condition, which you can see is involved with a great deal of morbidity and mortality uh, and decreasing quality of life? So these are some of the studies, mega studies, that have been performed. And just to summarize the results, the results have been disappointing. We have tried to use the same concept that we have used for systolic dysfunction uh, to the patient with diastolic dysfunction. Using ARBs, this is the CHARM, CHF, Candesartan, it was almost significant, a large number of patients, not very impressive. And you see the definition of diastolic dysfunction, ejection fraction, more than 40%. So many of these patients really had systolic dysfunction. The eye preserve, just published, I think, a couple of years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, Arbesartan, completely negative, completely negative. And then the, uh, the perindopril, this is the elderly coming from Europe, smaller number of patients, uh, over 70 years old. Again, ejection fraction more than 40%. The study was negative. The senior study, and two years ago when I was here, the late Paul Wilson, who was here and spoke about that, made a strong, strong statement about this as an evidence for the effect of beta blockers in patients with diastolic dysfunction. But look at the ejection fraction that they use, and many of these patients actually had systolic dysfunction. So at the end of the day, we have not been able to produce evidence-based medicine for this condition. These are ongoing trials, and you can see very interesting that somebody is trying to pace the patient because of the, uh, the uh, chronotropic incompetence. But I think the most promising is the sildenafil, the relaxed trial. And I'm saying it based on this study, which just published from, uh, from Italy, demonstrating a tremendous effect, a tremendous effect. This is here the pulmonary vascular resistance, sildenafil, in a group of patients with diastolic dysfunction and, uh, and uh, pulmonary hypertension. And I'm going to conclude by just reviewing quickly the, the, the guidelines, which really have not changed uh, for a long time because of lack of new evidence. So the physician should control systolic and diastolic blood pressure, control ventricular rate in patients with atrial fibrillation,
use diuretics for congestion, coronary revascularization because of the fact that ischemia may be cause of a cause of diastolic dysfunction, restoration and maintenance of sinus rhythm in patients with atrial fibrillation who are symptomatic, and then maybe the use of beta adrenergic blocking agent, ACE inhibitors, or calcium antagonists uh, in patients who are not really helped by other modalities. But here, remember, there's a reminder that digoxin, digitalis, is not effective. Let me just summarize. This condition is common and found in about 50% of patients with heart failure, more common in the elderly, women, and in patients with hypertension. The cl clinical presentation is similar to that of patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. The same incidence of hospitalizations and mortality, but non-cardiac causes are more prevalent. There's no evidence-based treatment available, and the guidelines recommend mostly, or the recommendations are mostly level C, based on expert opinion, and include control of blood pressure, diuretics for congestion, cardioversion and rate control in atrial fibrillation and revascularization. And lastly, pulmonary arterial hypertension may become an important target of therapy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for, again for the invitation and for allowing to share our results uh, with you. Most of the results I will share with you from the lab of uh, Professor Leo Gebstein from uh, the Technion and uh, and I will, uh, you've seen yesterday the campus, so I will skip that uh, and uh, go to, uh, these are Nobel laureates, we mentioned them yesterday, and I will touch this day on the research that we've done uh, at uh, the Technion at R and Rambam uh, on stem cell program. Uh, the program at, at Rambam started oh, more than 10 years ago uh, with uh, Professor uh, Itzkovich, who is uh, OBGYN, uh, head of OBGYN, and also head of the stem cells program at the Technion right now, who was uh, really did the first studies with Thompson uh, to generate the first human embryonic stem cell lines in the world. Actually, the, the cell lines that were published in Science paper uh, in 1989, Oh, I'm sorry, it, it was a, it, it's a science paper uh, in uh, uh, 19, yeah, uh, just before the, the year 2000. Uh, it was a paper by Thompson and Itzkovich was the second author. And this actually introduced the human embryonic stem cell lines to, to practice. He was able then to uh, share his results with Professor Gebstein, who at that time was a young MD, PhD, a cardiologist and he was able to really produce the first human embryonic stem cell lines in, in his lab. Um, uh, I think this was really a, a major development uh, at, at that time and uh, what I want to share with you is that the concept is obviously is to take the in vivo fertilized egg uh, with the eight cell embryo and then the blastocyst, you take the pluripotent cells out of them and then from them you can uh, grow them uh, for long term and generate uh, all types of cells, neural cells, cardiac cells, blood cells. Uh, these are the human embryonic stem cells, the initial concept. Uh, again, this is a paper by Kehat, a JCI, the first paper that introduced the cardiac cells. You can see here uh, different phases in, in the Petri dish. You can see embryo bodies that are generated. And, and within that, you can identify these contracting islets of cells, which are the, uh, the cardiac cells uh, that are generated with this. Uh, it actually took uh, quite a lot of work to characterize these cells and, uh, and be able to define based on their characteristics, all the different uh, attributes of uh, human cardiac cells. And, and, then, uh, and then in a beautiful paper from the lab, Kehat et al. in Nature Bio Biotechnology in 2004, they were able to take these cells and, and implant them in a pig heart. These are human embryonic cell lines that are impla implanted in a pig heart with a model of AV, AV block. This pig heart had an AV block in that uh, 
in, in that uh, heart. And they were actually to, uh, being able to show that after two weeks, these cells actually uh, make connection with the rest of the myocardium of the pig heart and was able to paste the entire pig heart from the location of injection. You can, this was also shown by PM and by histological studies later on that the cells are viable after one month here and, uh, and that they are within the site of injection that was done uh, surgically uh, with a tie and actually with a biosense uh, mapping, uh, electromechanical mapping you can actually identify that the source of pacing was really the site of pacemaker uh, cell implantation, the human embryonic uh, cell implantation. So this is really an ex exciting uh, potential uh, project because you can use here the stem cells for a potential treatment uh, of, uh, of, of AV block, a, a potential replacement of a, of a, of a pacemaker. Uh, just to let, let you know, in this case, the study was done in a pig heart with human cells. So the, 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 there was a need for aggressive anti-immune uh, uh, anti, uh, uh, response, anti response treatment in this pig heart. But this actually proven also the concept that you can do these things uh, even across species. So the success within a species is obviously uh, very high. Obviously, uh, the studies were also aimed at uh, trying to prove heart failure uh, 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 efficiency in this, uh, of these cells. And, and in, in another paper that was published in 2007, Caspi et al. have really shown this in a rat infarct model. They actually uh, uh, used the rat infarct model. They injected the cells. Uh, uh, these are uh, millions of cells that were injected. They actually were shown, they were tested these uh, rats at 30 days and 60 days with echocardiography. They then did a, a histological analysis and they could show that uh, uh, cells were identified alive after even after uh, 60 days. So the cells stay there in the myocardium after injection. And you can also see uh, there are three groups here. Uh, the uh, you, see, you see this is fractional shortening on the, on the, on the y-axis. So there is Im improvement in the, in, the, in, the, in the green group. This is the group where cells were injected uh, into, uh, into the myocardium versus the control versus two groups. A group that only, only a solution was was injected, so you see a continuous deterioration function in a group where uh, uh, nothing was done, again, a, a deterioration of function. So this really showed that in a rat model, these stem cells, human embryonic stem cells, both stay and, and improve the function in the rat model. So, uh, so there are many challenges to make this into practical thing, especially with the human embryonic stem cells. We're not talking about skeletal uh, muscle cells or, other, or adult stem cells. Uh, and, and the challenges are, are, are as follows. First of all, scaling up. It is a very tedious procedure to grow these cells, uh, even outside the body. And you need bioreactors and three-dimensional bioreactors to grow these cells. So scaling up is a challenge, but it's doable. It's not, uh, you know, in biotechnology you can do these things. Immune rejection. Immune rejection is a challenge, uh, which is associated with allogenic cell transplantation. It can be modified. It can be genetically uh, helped, but it's still a challenge to, to test when we get to the first, uh, I would say, or, or even more advanced clinical studies. Functional integration of host and donor cells have been shown to happen, but th does it really happen in a high percentage or only in a low percentage? It still needs to be proven because uh, we've seen it in the pacemaker model, but it has to really show uh, that it, it functions uh, in, in, in all uh, other type of conditions. Significant donor cell loss following engraftment is, uh, is another a potential uh, challenge, and obviously uh, the maturation of the tissue is, an, is, is, a, is also 
another challenge because uh, we see that it takes sometimes two, three months to cells to mature in a cell, uh, in, in a cell uh, culture in vitro. So uh, there is another, so this was an approach where you use only, only cells and try to inject them into the body. There's another approach, which is a tissue engineering approach. That means you take uh, different cells together with a construct, with a biopolymer or other type of construct to try and generate a tissue out of the, out of the, of the body. And this is what has been done in this study. Uh, the a tissue engineering approach to the heart means you take uh, uh, you have uh, a scar tissue and you try to replace it with a cardiac patch that you actually patch it to the myocardium surgically in this case. So uh, uh, the tissue engineering approach was also tested in collaboration with biomedical engineering and, uh, 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 and the aim is to generate functional contracting human engineered heart tissue with the multicellular interactions with human vascularized cardiac muscle construct and in using techniques of in situ tissue engineering techniques. And, and this is the concept that we, the, 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 the studies have been done together with uh, uh, Dr. Gepstein and Dr. Uh, Shulamit Levenberg for biomedical engineering. You can see concepts that are, you can really generate such contracts multicellular. I mean, uh, the, the, the use is the use of a polymer together with a, a polymer with a shape, with a structure. It should be elastic in a way if you want to, to, to be able to contract, loaded with uh, cardiac cells as well as endothelial cells and really generating both tissue and vascular tissue and being able to generate this contracting uh, muscle band that can actually contract uh, uh, even in, in, in vitro and then in situ. Um, so uh, I think that uh, this paper by Caspi et al. in circulation research showed this idea in, in such kind of a tissue engineering approach in a patch. This is a patch polymer, and you can really show that the myocytes, cardiomyocytes, uh, live there. They function together. They contract. And, and actually, you can have construct that will contain cardiomyocytes, endothelial cells, and embryonic fibroblast. All these three major elements together to generate tissue. And you see, you can see all the elements of the tissue generated ex vivo, and then you can implant it into the heart and, uh, and, and try to integrate it. So the concept is that you can be able to take this patch and connect it to the muscle. You can see it connected here to the muscle. Patch it to the outside and show and they have been able to show that there is growth of vessels between the patch and the, and the, and the regular myocardium and the scaffold is, is, is viable. Whether it increases function, how will it integrate electromechanically, it still needs to be proven. There is still a way, but you see all the challenges that take to be able to actually do this construction engineering. So this was uh, in situ tissue engineering. There is another approach, injectable biomaterials. Ma the rationale is that you can inject a bioresorbable scaffold. The, again, you use a scaffold, but this scaffold, if you uh, uh, light it with UV light, it polymerizes and, and polymerizes in situ. So the idea, inject a bioresorbable scaffold and then can replace the missing extracellular matrix and provide a temporary structural support for inf infarct repair. The rationale for that was that sometimes you inject millions of cells into the myocardium and one day later there are, most of them are gone and you only te have 10% or less gone. So with this approach, they're trying to, to get much more adherence of the, of the cells and remain in situ. This approach also allows super, as we, we said, superior entrapment and protective envi environment for transplanted cells. And this, this is the concept. You use, this, uh, 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 you use this light to be able to, uh, uh, to polymerize in situ the injectable polymer. You can inject the polymer directly to the muscle. And you can see here then the muscle cells with a, with a polymerized injectable polymer in there. And at 30 days, you can see cells, the human embryonic stem cells that are stay there. So it's, uh, it's really fascinating approach 
remains to be seen how it really can translate into clinical practice. Again, this is the RET model, cell ion only, only cells, as you can see, uh, uh, only polymer in this case. So only polymer also has some kind of, a, of an effect, and, and then uh, cells plus polymers have the best of the effect. So it's very interesting, the injectable uh, tissue approach uh, and the functional analysis, analysis by Habib et al. is shown here, showing that this uh, scaffold with uh, uh, polymer plus cells increases function of in this RET model. Um, uh, there is another direction that we have taken in our cath lab, which is based on the work of Yamanaka et al. As we, we all uh, probably have heard, Yamanaka, uh, uh, biological researcher from, from Japan was able to show that if he uses four type of uh, four uh, genes, you can make adult cells into embryonic stem cells. Plui, you call them induced pluripotent stem cells, IPCs. And with this technique, you can actually then take skin cells or fibroblasts from adult, transform them into cells, and then into stem cells, and then from them you can generate cardiac cells, nerve cells, any cells that you'd like. We were able to actually reproduce his technique in our lab uh, with Leo Gepstein by Tsui et al. This is a paper in circulation. He, he was able to show uh, from fibroblast, he was able to generate the IPCs with this genetic technique and then be able to uh, transform them into uh, cardiac cells with, the, with, the, with all the structural uh, ability, and this uh, induced pluripotential stem cells, derived myocytes, could really generate uh, uh, electrical propagation, electrical activation, and, and a maps of electrical uh, propagation. They really have an ECG, which we, we look in, the, in from the outside. It's a fascinating way how you see you can take some, uh, an adult skin cell from an adult patient and, trans and, and get out of this same patient the, the, the stem cells. So, I mean, the, the, the idea is that you can do it for a heart failure case and, uh, and use the stem cells, uh, use the skin cells from the same patient and then grow many cells in the lab and then implant them back. This is a concept. You can use it for the pacemaker technology that we mentioned before. It's a really fascinating way to, to do it. And this is some examples of, of this uh, all of the cardiac cells that are generated by this technique, you can see they're not all well organized. If you don't put the stem cells in a contracting environment, then the sarcomeres are generated in a much, in a not linear fashion, they're sometimes circular, as you can see here, but they are generated. You can see the sarcomeres forming in these cells. It's really fascinating to see how it, it is happening, and the concept really is myocardial replacement therapies and personalized patient-specific drug screening, we can actually generate heart cells of a, of a diseased patient. Even, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example with the genetic abnormalities and be able to test it in, in, in situ. This is the concept that we were uh, taking. You can take somatic cells. You can generate with reprogramming with these four, four genes, sometimes even three genes, gen uh, IPS cells. From them, you can actually uh, take Patient disease specific cardiomyocytes, you can do structural analysis, you can do gene expression, you can do patch clamp experiments, uh, calcium imaging, and also you can do multi electrode array recording for electrical activation. You can really study in individual patients uh, uh, extensively. We did it in a patient with long QT syndrome. We all know long QT syndrome, we have a potassium channel abnormalities. And actually, uh, Dr. Gepstein was able to take this uh, uh, fibroblast from the skin from this patient, generate these uh, IPCs, and generate the arrhythmia in the lab, in the dish. And then you can actually test it with drugs. I mean, if you generate this cell, which is abnormality, has this abnormal gene, you can then go back to the, to the lab. You see, this is uh, real data. This is control, normal cell. This is long QT cell that was generated in the, from this patient, and, uh, and you can pace it, and then you can even generate uh, in these cells arrhythmias. Uh, you can see here, they usually have uh, 
EADs, uh, uh, delayed after the, the, the polarization, and the, they can generate also uh, 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 all this trigger the activity and, and can go into something like VF in the dish, and then you can test different drugs, how they act and how they uh, ameliorate this function. So, with this, I can uh, conclude. Cardiomyocyte derived from human embryonic stem cells produce contracting cardiac tissue that can integrate with adult myocardium, used as pacemaker and enhanced contraction. Tissue engineering approaches are being explored for generating fully functional tissue construct that can actually be implanted either surgically or with inje through injection and polymer polymerization, even uh, through catheterization. Induced pluripotent uh, cells have a great potential for a variety of therapeutic approaches and for exploring genetic myocardial disease and to tailor pharmacological therapy. I mention again, uh, those of you who want to visit the ICI meeting in, on innovations in cardiology in 2012 in, in Israel. I welcome you all there. And this is a beautiful Baha'i garden in Haifa. Uh, that's another city for you to come and visit uh, if I can invite you all. And uh, this is uh, another view of the Haifa and Baha'i gardens at night time. Thank you very much. I must admit that I, I find the talk on this case with VT much more exciting than my talk. So, so I'm <coughs> quite excited about the, the opportunities and the very <coughs> sophisticated care that SIMS can provide. I, I'm not sure that this patient would have survived at our center, really. So this is <coughs> most impressive. And also, <coughs> we would have uh, had a lot of discussions in, in, in our kind of high-income country, whether we could have afforded this type of treatment. So maybe we should send our patients to SIMS, because the cost would have been 10 times, maybe even higher than 10 times more at our center than at SIMS. So as I said yesterday, I'm coming from, from Sweden, northern Europe, close to the North Pole. It's a pleasure to be here in, in winter when you have kind of our summer weather. I work at Uppsala University where we have a clinical research center. <coughs> Uh, focusing on cardiology, and, and this is our university founded, I mean, 600 years ago, and the biomedical center. So we have <coughs> more kind of developed science there, but, but I think there are such enormous opportunities when you come <coughs> to see the challenges in, in India. So I was asked to review what we think about antithrombotic <coughs> treatment in non-STEMI and STEMI, and I have based it uh, mainly on, on the European guidelines. I have first to disclose that I have been working with most companies developing new antithrombotic agents for the last few years. So this is in summary, I, I think, the guidelines that we have worldwide for treatment of acute coronary syndromes nowadays. So when we see these patients, in the emergency room, of course, we obtain the history and an ECG and today a troponin test. And, and that's very good both for diagnosing and risk stratification. Everybody <coughs> then is treated if there is an indication of an acute coronary syndrome with an aspirin, a P2Y12 inhibitor, and beta blocker, and, and nitrates. If there is ST segment elevation, of course, we go directly for reperfusion treatment. <coughs> I think in, in most Western countries now with primary PCI, but if that is not available, thrombolysis is used. And in these patients, of course, uh, the same antithrombotic agents as in non-ST segment elevation are used, so these patients are treated with an anticoagulant and aspirin and also a P2Y12 inhibitor. So very similar approach to antithrombotic treatment in both ST segment elevation. In the non-ST segment elevation patients, based on suspicion, these patients are beyond aspirin and P2Y12 inhibition, also treated with an anticoagulant. And there we have four different choices, and it's a little bit up to uh, 
the investigator to choose whether he prefers to send the patients more or less directly to a procedure and then using one of the IV short acting agents, unfractionated heparin or bivalirudin, or whether the invasive procedure maybe is postponed and then a low molecular weight heparin and fond or fondaparinox is used. And very much depend on risk stratification in the non-ST elevation ACS setting. Patients at high risk, with high risk indicators, you add usually a 2B3 inhibitor and send the patient urgently to a procedure. In the intermediate risk patient, usually they have to wait for <coughs> maybe somewhere between one, two, three, four days before a procedure and you keep them protected on antiplated treatment and usually fond of paranox. In the low risk patients, you do additional investigation procedures to identify whether there is any important ischemia or not. And then patients are discharged, of course, on a combination of antithrombotic agents, aspirin and the P2I12 inhibitor, in addition to the usual secondary prevention agent, beta blocker statins, ACE inhibition. So that means that every patient with an acute coronary syndrome really is leaving the hospital with five medications and that's challenging. It's challenging to add something onto that because these patients usually also have other diseases. They, they have diabetes and they might have unrelated diseases such as rheumatic diseases, etc. So this is really a polypharmacy. So over the last few years, I mean beyond aspirin, there are another <coughs> set of agents that are used. I think what's developing just now is the new P2I12 inhibitors, Prasugrel and Ticagrelor is coming in, and I know that Prasugrel is approved in India, and Ticagrelor hopefully will be approved in, in January also in India. It is approved now in 40, more than 40 different countries. So these are the agents that are clinically available to inhibit platelet activation, and we have the 2B3 inhibitors for patients going to urgent PCI procedure, and especially in, in the STEMI situation. Most, much of what we are doing is, of course, based on clinical trials, and these clinical trial results are then translated into the guidelines. And the guideline committee for the European Society, of course, was scrutinizing what did the current trial show us concerning the different dosages of clopidogrel and aspirin, and they d just relied on this subgroup result, that in patients sent to a PCI, there was a benefit of the high loading dose of 600 milligrams <coughs> versus 300 milligrams clopidogrel, reducing ischemic events and especially stent thrombosis. There was an increase in bleed, but still this high loading dose was accepted. And therefore, concerning clopidogrel dosing, what the European guidelines tell us is that <coughs> you can use clopidogrel for patients who cannot receive ticagrelor and prasugrel, and that is that clopidogrel now is downgraded to a second-line agent. If you use clopidogrel, you should choose a 600 milligram loading dose <coughs> or <coughs> supplement by giving another 300 milligram dose if you already have started, if patients are sent to an invasive strategy. A higher maintenance dose of clopidogrel should be considered for the first seven days, but this is not really thought to be evidence-based, and few people in, in Europe still use this, although I have heard that that's commonly used in India. Then, of course, the guideline committee looked into the Triton TM38 study, <coughs> comparing Prasugrel versus Clopidogrel with a 60 milligram loading dose, 10 milligram maintenance dose with a more intense platelet inhibition with a much more rapid onset. They relied a lot on this reduction in ischemic events seen very early after a PCI procedure because this was a PCI study showing a reduction especially in association with PCI and showing a pronounced reduction in stent thrombosis focusing on patients treated with PCI. They realized the increased risk of bleeding and 
it's that you need to be cautious in certain risk population. And this turned out then to be the European recommendations for the use of Prasugrel. It is recommended for P2Y12 inhibitor naive patients, that is, patients previously taking clopidogrel or previously started on clopidogrel was not recommended to be started on Prasugrel because of the bleeding risk. They noticed <coughs> that there were subgroups that seemed to benefit more than others. And they also observed that this study was done in patients where coronary anatomy already was known and who is proceeding to PCI. So this is for patients non-treated with clopidogrel with known coronary anatomy <coughs> undergoing PCI. So selected population, but in that population there is strong evidence of a benefit of presugrel versus clopidogrel. The guideline committee also evaluated the PLATO study that I have been <coughs> reviewing extensively at this meeting the 180 milligram loading dose, the 90 milligram twice daily dose, in a very broad population with <coughs> acute coronary syndromes, randomized directly on admission, showing this efficacy result with a gradual increase in the benefit in cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke, and showing a reduction also in mortality, which I think led to the recommendation that you soon will see. There was a reduction in stent thrombosis also, and there was no difference in overall bleeding. And I think this really affected the recommendations. The guideline group observed that although there was no difference in overall bleeding, during long-term treatment there is around a 30% increase in spontaneous bleeding when using more intense plated inhibition with ticagrelor than clopidogrel. So, because of the current evidence, ticagrelor is recommended for all patients at moderate to high risk of ischemic events, that is really all cameras with acute coronary syndrome, regardless of initial treatment strategy, regardless whether the patients are planned to be sent to an invasive or managed non-invasively, and also including those previously treated with clopidogrel, so even if somebody in the ambulance or emergency room had started clopidogrel, they are recommended to be restarted and switched to ticagrelor. And this is a scientifically very strong recommendation. It's based only on one trial, of course, but then ticagrelor has become, in Europe, the drug of first choice for acute coronary syndrome patients. Patients treated with thrombolysis, though, were not included in the trial, and for those patients still, clopidogrel is the antiplatelet agent of choice. We have seen trials of some additional agents, Vorapaxar, a thrombin receptor inhibitor. We had great hopes for that compound, but uh, it did not really turn out to show an <coughs> additional benefit in patients already treated with aspirin and clopidogrel. Although cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke was reduced, the quadruple primary endpoint was not reduced, including also urgent revascularization. And I think the reason for not recommending it is really based on the increase in bleeding and especially the increase in intracranial hemorrhage. As you can see, there is a rate of up to 1% intracranial hemorrhage, which is very high. In the PLATO trial with Tacagalor, we were concerned about intracranial hemorrhage, and in that trial it amounted to 0.1%. So this is a tenfold increase in relation to the intracranial hemorrhage rate seen with Tacagalor. So therefore, Vorapaxar in combination with aspirin and clopidogrel will not be used. So therefore, the overall recommendation for antiplatelet agents in <coughs> non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome today in the European society is that, of course, you should use aspirin at a high loading dose, up to 300 milligram, and then a low maintenance dose, 75 to 100 milligram. There should be an addition of a P2Y12 inhibitor. You should also consider a proton pump inhibitor, <coughs> and th this will not affect the, at all ticagrelor efficacy or prasugrel efficacy and probably not even clopidogrel. And then <coughs> concerning P2Y12 inhibition, ticagrelor is a drug of first choice and prasugrel is a drug of second choice. Of course, we have the option to also use <coughs> coagulation inhibition and that should be added in the acute phase. 
mainly nowadays as low molecular weight heparin or fondaparinox, reducing the 10A activity, but <coughs> acutely unfractionated heparin or bivalirudin is an alternative. And it's very difficult to say which of these approaches are most effective because all of them influence several levels in the coagulation cascade. So this is just the results using fondaparinox, showing that that has a lower risk of bleeding <coughs> <coughs> in comparison to fonda, uh, in comparison to enoxaparin, and therefore fonda is a preferred agent in this setting. <coughs> and Bivalirudin today has become also a drug of first choice in <coughs> comparison to <coughs> heparin and a GP inhibitor. So in, in Europe, if you send the patients acutely to a procedure, bivalirudin has a high level of recommendation. <coughs> if you go for a prolonged treatment, fondaparinox is really the drug of choice. When you treat these patients, you need to consider the bleeding risk, and in Europe there is a recommendation to use a bleeding score, but whether that is used in clinical practice can be discussed. But the balance really between benefit and ischemic events need to be taken in consideration. So overall, I, I think that we have reached now the final level. There have been attempts to use adding on a long-term anticoagulation but that leads to a lot of bleeding with warfarin. And uh, as I indicated already yesterday, although there was benefit with rivaroxaban, but not the pixaban, adding to topidogrel and aspirin, the bleeding rates were probably too high to make this an effective treatment because the bleeding rates, it's doubtful whether they are compensated by reduction in ischemic events. And these high bleeding rates are seen both with rivaroxaban and the pixaban. So therefore, it is really a balancing of benefits and risks, and the guideline has taken that into consideration, recommending now aspirin, a P2Y12 inhibitor, <coughs> for long term and in the acute phase, one of the standard anticoagulant agents, either bivalirudin as <coughs> acutely and for long term, fondaparinox for up to a week. And I think that's all. Thank you very much. House, uh, this big full of our physicians trying to learn and that will be my goal that provide you the data both clinically some uh, basic for many of you who are interested in but really put in context with the three cases and I'll ask you to raise the hands for the answers when after I present the case and then we'll come to the answer and solution uh, of uh, those cases. With that note, I, with the clearly acute coronary syndrome, we all know that despite all we are doing, improvement in our lifestyle, early detection, ACS still remain the important uh, enigma which we need to treat, manage, and of course uh, improve the patient prognosis. Now, this slide basically reflects the spectrum of coronary artery disease from a stable angina to the STEMI. And what happens? Why somebody from stable goes to STEMI? It is not the degree of obstruction of the plaque. See, in stable you have actually more obstruction. What changes is that how much thrombus and clot you make in the artery. It is the degree of thrombus which determines an overall presentation, whether it's the ACS, unstable angina, STEMI, and non-STEMI. And of course, beyond that, we know many patients are asymptomatic and some people have sudden death. But key is that within the syndrome of the acute coronary syndrome is the degree of thrombus. So thrombus becomes the most important culprit. So we need to find out why people develop that thrombus and what starts it and what is the best way to treat it. Now, for actually, you know, we want to have a common nomenclature, whether it's in uh, USA, India, or Africa. And therefore, we have come up with a common theme Although acute coronary syndrome takes care of the STEMI patients also, patient comes in, chest pain, ST elevation, is STEMI. But we don't talk about STEMI as a true ACS. Because STEMI is a totally different Q wave MI, which we used to call STEMI, totally different uh, treatment pathway. What it is, is that not having a STEMI, and then we do, very important is the cardiac markers. 
used to be a myoglobin, CKMB, uh, and so on, now the troponin, and if the troponin comes positive, it's called non stemming And if troponin is negative, it's unstable angina, and that makes ACS. Clear? When we are talking about ACS, we are talking about two different groups, non stemmy and unstable angina, and STEMI, of course, is ACS, but kind of a totally different set. Now, what is happening? Well, is the overall trend, if you see, that non STEMI happening more than STEMI. Actually, in United States, is the true. Here, I would say in India, both acute coronary syndrome and STEMI are increasing. Now, we actually, if you say, you probably are somewhere here, that both are at increase in terms of the STEMI and non STEMI, and part of that has been now early detection and widespread prevention, which you have been started. But USA is quite far ahead. Now you say, well, why that is happening? Why non STEMI versus STEMI? Very simple. One is early detection. Second, primary prevention. Patient taking aspirin, patient taking statin. If you develop a coronary event, usually it is acute coronary syndrome or non STEMI rather than STEMI. And therefore, the early detection treatment is very, very important. Now you say, well, okay, ACS, now you are having more, but having a less. STEMI is probably a good thing. Now I'll show you one slide. This actually from the gastro trials. Gastro trials was in the trial done in late 90s of various antithrombotic antiplatelet therapy and many of these acute coronary syndrome. Now just concentrate on few. This is the 30 day, this is the six month. ST elevation is here and ST depression is here. So this is your non-STEMI, this is STEMI. STEMI has a higher mortality at 30 days compared to non-STEMI. Now you go beyond 30 days. Go to six months. Guess what is happening? Where is your ST elevation? Right here. Where is your non STEMI? Is up, has crossed with higher REMI and higher mortality. Therefore, ACS, non STEMI, is not benign. On a long term, actually, it is worse. So, how can that happen? There are a few reasons, actually. One of them is very important that we know how to treat our STEMI patients. We do not know how to treat our acute coronary syndrome patients. There is no clear-cut protocol. We know in STEMI, thrombolytic, getting to the cath lab and so. Here, non-STEMI, there is a wide range. Until recently, there has been a clear-cut guidelines now. But this to highlight that non-STEMI is not a benign. And the second is that patients with the non-STEMI are not as clear or in terms of the risk factor as STEMI. Non-STEMI patients are usually uh, multiple medical conditions with the diabetes, heart failure, prior MIs, and so multi-vessel disease compared to STEMI is a single vessel uh, disease. Now, the, also the patients we have seen that patients even comes to the hospital and if they develop MI in the hospital, their prognosis is worse than even if they come, on, come with the MI. Basically what it slide shows from the pursuit trial is that if patient comes in with a chest pain and has a negative enzymes, but develop MI, negative enzymes, but develop MI in the hospital is worse than if he came in with the MI. Again, it is the system that you diagnose the patient properly and treat it properly is very important. Now, therefore, you say, well, do we need to worry about every patient coming with a chest pain having acute coronary syndrome? And if it is, how do we grade them? It's just like any infection. You can have URI, pneumonia, and sepsis. Same thing is in acute coronary syndrome, that there is various gradation. So we need to have some guidance how to treat one patient versus other. There are various algorithms have been published. The most common being we call the Timmy risk score. Timmy risk score was derived by two major trials, Ascents and Timmy 11B. Those were the trials with the low NOx versus uh, unfractionated heparin. And they came up with the seven independent factor, which transmitted have an individual risk, risk ratio of event. Age, more than 65. Three risk factor of the CAD1 being the diabetes, known significant coronary lesion, ST segment deviation, severe angina symptom, patient having chest pain quite a bit. Patients are on aspirin developing acute syndrome and increased serum cardiac marker. Why it is important? Because you can divide these patients to the low risk if the age is less than two. Three and four are intermediate risk and high risk is five, six and seven. Because we know that high risk we all been treating them taking them to the cath lab. Low risk probably we know many times, 
but intermediate risk which makes half of our cases or 60% of our patients are the really make a decision what to do with them. And that becomes very important and that will be part of my presentation as the case uh, selection of course, troponin becomes the very important. Now this case of course has died, is one that extreme uh, group. Patient had a plaque rupture, we learned that it's the lipid content of the plaque, ruptures at the corner and comes into the blood content, caused the th thrombosis, total occlusion, and the patient died. But what I'm showing it for, look at this side. There is an organized thrombus in this patient. Few days, few weeks before this fatal event, this patient had acute coronary syndrome. So this was the acute coronary syndrome. Our goal is to diagnose and treat at this level of the small thrombus so it does not have a full occlusion and full thrombosis. Now, what causes this? We learn substrate is the lipid rich plaque. The stimulus is the disruption, injury to the plaque. And of course, final response is thrombosis. And this is a very, very intricate mechanism. And I'm sure all of us sitting here having part of the plaque rupture, but not everybody developing thrombosis acute coronary syndrome. Why? There is a mechanistic slide I actually have made uh, based on that many of these plaque ruptures are kind of a tip of this uh, iceberg. That basically, a lot of subclinical issues goes on and when it breaks the barrier, that causes acute coronary syndrome. But what happens subclinically which ultimately breaks? Most important is our CAD risk factors of hyperlipidemia, obesity, hyperglycemia, hypertension, sedentary lifestyle. These are the patients who are at the, or people actually become patient because they are at risk of developing this plaque rupture and they have the change and abnormal chemistry in terms of multiple vulnerable plaque, vascular inflammation and persistent hyperreactive platelets. These are the factors. So it's a milieu. Even if the patients you treat it, they'll come back again because the plaque will continue to rupture. Now you say how does the risk factor leads into this? And this is the another mechanistic slide I made that if you have just think about your normal, your normal endothelium, normal endogenous uh, inhibitors, that if there is any stimuli of which is causing the damage to our endothelium, injury, erosion or rupture, will be a low, very strong stimuli which will cause thrombosis. But if you have risk factor, prothrombotic state like diabetes, impaired endothelium, hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, sedentary lifestyle, all of them will decrease our threshold so that even a shorter, a smaller stimuli will cause the thrombosis and patient will have acute coronary syndrome. Now more important than what we try to do by our therapy, by exogenous therapy, we try to balance this normal threshold uh, from the abnormal and overall manage these patients. Also we learn acute coronary syndrome is not a disease of one artery or one lesion. It's a vulnerable plaque in the multiple vessels. Actually studies have shown that you have two or three acute coronary lesions when patient present. Same thing, it's a pan-coronary process and with the inflammations and so. The platelets, which is one of the important, they're actually very uh, hyperactive and they're increasing their volume and so. And the inflammation and various inflammatory markers which actually have been looked into, important being the C-reactive protein which is produced by liver, but then many other markers of the end organ damage which have shown that patients with acute coronary syndrome are continuously inflamed as if you are having a constant sore throat bronchitis, that they continue to be inflamed and therefore continue to rupture. So goal is that we need to fix that. Uh, CRP is one of them and studies have shown high CRP with higher acute coronary syndrome and of course statins not only by decreasing the lipids, LDL, but more importantly by decreasing CRP have a pleiotropic effect and better uh, overall outcome. Now the process of this thrombosis it starts with the injury to the vessel wall and the platelets which are circulating comes in contact with the damaged endothelium and becomes excited. And what happens? Basically they express the receptors called 2B3A and these receptors then bind to the fibrinogen, makes it the platelet plug. And the RBCs fall inside there, becomes your red plug. So initially the white plug in the acute coronary syndrome, then become a red plug with a platelet aggregation and that's where the platelet become the most important uh, stimulus.
So very important that the work we done to treat these patients if focusing on the platelet. And of course, there are so many platelet receptors that they, every few weeks, few months, few years, amongst various trials, and I know that SIMS has been a leader in many of these new anti-platelet, anti-thrombotic agent trials, with trying to find out that what is the best agent to prevent this platelet aggregation. And you keep hearing it, uh, many of them, and also, the platelet not only get stimulated by coming to the endothelium, they come to the surface, come to that vessel, and they release many of these chemical factors which cause the further rupture of the plaque. So they do not, not only initiate, but also accentuate the process of thrombosis and plaque instability and rupture of the plaque. So this is just a slide to show that platelet activation is a very complex process and require multiple pathways, therefore we need a multiple drugs to inhibit this pathway. And that's therefore, based on the severity of the symptoms, we may need to use one drug, two drugs, three drugs, or four drugs. Because how much the platelets are activated, we need to uh, counteract them, so they now cannot now bind with the fibrinogen and cannot make the plug, and they do well. And therefore, if we sum it up that in the ACS, how do we start? We work on the thrombin generation by heparin and antithrombotic therapy, and many new agents by platelet activation by giving anti-platelet drug and inflammation by giving anti-inflammatory agent, most important being the statins, many other being still tried. So this is basically is the treatment strategy based on the pathophysiology of the acute coronary syndrome when we get. Now, now we come to the intervention when we manage these patients. Now see this slide. This is the LAD and this is a ruptured plaque. And see at this level there is a shadow which is detaching and going down. You know what it is? It's not the air bubble, because the air bubble would have been from the catheter here. This is the thrombus on the plaque. So this patient presented with acute coronary syndrome because this plaque is going, this thrombus is going down, has a non stemmy because going down here blocks and cause the release. So now if you, this patient comes to the cath lab, now you want to put a stent in this, what will happen? We'll put a wire, our stent, first thing stent will do, will push this thrombus down and will cause non stemmy will cause infarction so that what have we learned our earlier trials of intervention when we took this patients right away without any treatment to the cath lab we have higher myocardial infarction in some studies even higher death rate be precisely because the, there was a thrombus on the plaque so what is the message that you need to dissolve that thrombus rapidly before you take them to the cath lab and that is one of the very important factor we learned in last 10 years to have a better outcome of your uh, patients and we also learned that once you, because platelets are important, it's not need to be given short term, need to be given for long term. These are the data of the 30 day versus one year in both the trials, uh, credo and PCI cure, that one year is better than 30 days. Then question was, should you increase the dose? And OSC7, uh, I learned from uh, Kiyur that he was the lead enroller in this uh, trial of uh, 300 plus patients, uh, basically giving a double dose of uh, clopidogrel for one week versus standard dose and found basically that double dose is better than single dose. So we learned that patients who are going to the cath lab, double dose of clopidogrel is better because of some resistance and so, which you can take care. Then there's still a room or need for a newer agent. And those are the two actually, we now have Presagrol and Ticagrelor. The clopidogrel is the indirect compound, Presagrol is a one step conversion, and then they have Ticagrelor is another agent which is actually reversible and it's not the, it does not work uh, with the cytochromes and works directly with the um, platelets. And uh, these are the two major trials which have been shown. Triton Timmy 38 showed basically that Presagrol is superior to clopidogrel but increased bleeding. So we had to be careful, although it decreased stent thrombosis. So any patients with the high risk of stent thrombosis makes sense to use a Presagrel compared to clopidogrel, same benefit in the diabetic patients, in myocardial infarction patients. But it caused more bleeding. So what we learn is that Presagrel should be used over clopidogrel, even the double dose, in patients with the STEMI, patients with the diabetes, and those who are non-responder to the clopidogrel. Then the second drug, which is a very exciting, ticagrelor, again comparing against the doses of various doses of the clopidogrel, found the similar benefit of what we learned in the TIMI 38, the ticagrelor has a lower event rate than clopidogrel, but without much increase in bleeding. 
so that now you have another agent which is approved in US and now it's coming to India. Press agrol is available here. Thai agrol or is not available here, will be available here soon. And if you decide where this is my, uh, I wrote a, uh, the editorial on uh, the various agents, press agrol, Thai agrol or Kuropredigrol, that I think uh, press agrol will use more in the diabetic and STEMI patients. Thai agrol or is the reversible, so used in more in acute coronary syndrome when the anatomy is not known. And every other patient will still use clopidogrel, but ticagrel or to have a more efficacious and less bleeding. And there, of course, many other new agents you will hear. Anti anticoagulants and antithrombotic, a lot of work has been done. Low molecular weight heparin is better than unfractionated heparin. Then low molecular weight heparin versus unfractionated in the cath lab showed no benefit. Then we have the Fonda Perinox, which is anoxaparin, showed that it is have a lower event rate compared to um, uh, um, Fonda Parinox compared to anoxaparin, but it has a higher catheter thrombosis, so that it's not used in PCI patients. It is good because it causes less bleeding and good in patients for medical management. And then the acuity using bivalodin showing that this is the agent you can use it in acute coronary syndrome right from the cath lab uh, and the emergency room and the management of ACS, which is equally as 2B3 and heparin, and yes, have a lower bleeding so that we select it. Now, to be the statins actually has been shown the overall benefit as shown uh, in the PROVID trial. Basically, what it does is the statins decrease your cholesterol contents. This is the MRI patients. Then you see that 17% your lipid deposit became 1%. So the statin basically work by removing the uh, basically the uh, the fat from the plaque. And this is basically the coming back to the combination of the treatment when we bring these patients by giving antithrombotic co-therapy of the multiple drugs based on their syndrome. Then we take them to the cath lab and then decide. And more importantly, the medical management of these patients on long run is very important. Having said that, now let's go through the three cases which I quickly present and we'll go come back to the answer that what are the right. This is the patient number one, 71 year old was fine, new onset of angina, risk factor is only smoking, uh, medication none, came to the doctor who saw him little hypertensive uh, and has, did the ETT, had a 2 millimeter ST depression after 5 minutes and cardiogram is normal. So basically patient has coronary artery disease, right, first time diagnosed and what the uh, physician started on aspirin, atenolol, rosuvastatin and started uh, long acting nitrate. Now question comes, what you do? Is that enough or you need to follow these patients by maybe admitting because new onset of angina or do a stress test or urgent for the cath or schedule for elective cath. We'll come back to it. Second case, 58 year old patient who had bypassed 48 um, years ago, had no angina until recently, now having crescendo angina for last two weeks, had chest pain when came to see a doctor in the office, had multiple risk factors, he's been on aspirin, beta blocker and statin and cardiovascular examination little hypertensive otherwise fine and the electrocardiogram is here these are real patients so that EKG may not be your perfect but no ST segment depression so now question is what you do patient is on some therapy had a prior bypass that do you admit this patient and start aggressive therapy schedule nuclear stress test and increase beta blocker or call the cath lab for urgent cath or maximize medical therapy and ask the patient to come back in two weeks Third patient, this is a 78-year-old female with chest pain for three hours, had mild new onset angina over last one month, CAD risk factors are multiple, patient has been on medication because known CAD and diabetic, and came to the emergency room and has a blood pressure of 90 over 60 and heart rate of 72, came early morning, 2.30 in the morning. Now this patient has a clear-cut ST segment depression and some ST elevation maybe, but more so ST depression. Some Q waves inferiorly, but ST segment depression. And of course, you got the po positive enzymes. You need to treat this patient early morning, right? You start with IV nitro, give heparin or Lovenox, whatever choices, because you give aptofibatide, then beta blocker, clopidogrel 300 milligram. Patient was already on beta blocker, but you have to give IV. And now question is, patient little response, what you do? Admit and observe this patient. You already have started the treatment and you change to PO metoprolol, obtain echo LV function and then decide with a poor LV they go to the cath lab or so.
or call for urgent cardiac cath or stabilize on maximum medical therapy and refer for cath only if chest pain recurs or continue. So three different scenario, three different type of patients and the question basically is the most important, whom do we manage medically, whom do we take to the cath lab? And this actually has been shown by our various trials that for, when we did the trials in the early time, we took them to the cath lab without pre-treatment and of course you can see here that invasive, immediate invasive therapy may be even harmful. But then over the years we understood that mechanism is that thrombus. If you clean that out by various trials of the Tactis, Interact, Rita, ISAR, Cool, that overall taking early intervention actually is beneficial than wait and watch policy. And these are the various endpoints here. And of course, the, if you go back to the risk score, that clearly that if you have high risk score, you do very well with the in invasive approach. If you have low risk score, invasive approach actually is harmful. But it's the intermediate risk score where you see that there is a benefit of invasive. But that is what we need to identify who is the intermediate risk score. Because we know these cases are simple. They are atypical chest pain. We know these cases are almost in shock. Crying, sweating and short of breath. This is the case which we need to understand. And of course troponin is a very important marker that uh, those patients should go to the cath lab. Then question comes, okay, you decided to take them to the cath lab. In these trials, some patients went to cath lab 16 hours, some went 72 hours. Then we actually now have two trials to really pinpoint when they should go to the cath lab. One of them is the Timex. Should you take them to the cath lab in 24 hours or you wait for 48 hours? Guess what? It has been shown that if you take them, wait 48 hours, you have higher event rate, particularly in the high risk cases. So therefore, the 24 hour is better rather than waiting 48 hours, more than 48 hours. Clear? acute coronary syndrome. Now second issue, what if you take them to the cath lab just like taking a STEMI patient within 90 minutes, which is the abort trial, they took the patient in 90 minutes and guess what they found? This is immediate in the red and delayed PCI and you can see here that overall event rate taking them to the immediate was actually slightly higher largely because they have a higher myocardial infarction. Why? You didn't give enough time for antiplatelet therapy to work. So that thrombus, which I showed you earlier, embolized and give rise to myocardial infarction. So you need some time for antiplatelet, antithrombotic therapy to work so that 16 to 18, 24 hours become the standard of treatment. Basically we learned that 2 b 3 a you do it in the cath lab, no need to give it in the emergency room at present and so. So therefore if we sum it up now, the invasive treatment is better with the aggressive antiplatelet therapy and if we apply to our patient, this is the first patient who has first time come to the physician and if you go to the Timmy risk score of this patient only risk is one is a low risk. So now the question comes is of this what is the cho choice one two three or four how many will say I clearly we say that it doesn't need urgent cath everybody agrees doesn't need to be admitted right very low risk the choice is could be two or could be four who will say for two raise the hand or four. Right? I think I would say in this case both are true. No urgency, but this patient has to have a plan to have further workup, do the, either the stress test later or the cath. Second case, and this patient actually had a cath. Uh, we did a LED diagonal intervention, used Epsiximab, Cypher stent, uh, and went home without any problem. Second patient. The second patient, I'm sorry we're taking a little uh, time, but uh, the who I had a new onset of angina. What are the timid risk factor in this case? Seeing you in the office, there are four. They fall into the intermediate risk group. The now question is what to do with this case? Should you increase the medication, do the stress test or admit? That is where these are the 60% of your patients will fall into this category. You send this patient home is scheduled for a stress test or your cath in next one to two week. You know what the data are? 10% will not make it to those, whether stress lab or to the cath lab because they'll be dead. So this patient has come here, does not go home, goes to the hospital, immediately admitted with aggressive therapy and of course then get the cath in next 16 to 24 hours. Not in two hours, not in 48 hours, in 16 to 24 hours, this has a vein graft, we had a stent and completely fine 
went home 16 hours later. Third patient who presented to the emergency room early morning in almost hypotension uh, with the various risk factors, you started the treatment and in this patient you calculate your TIMI risk score. What it is? Everything. High risk score. We don't know because the patient didn't have a known CAD. That's the only risk factor. Otherwise, high risk score. The now question is, in this case, what do you do? We know that we had to take him to the cath lab, but in this case, because patient is still hypotensive, it has to be the urgent cardiac cath. It's not a true STEMI, but it's behaving like a STEMI because in six hours, this is two, three o'clock in the morning when these patients present. By eight hour, by eight and nine o'clock, this patient will go into shock with a spiral down myocardial infarction. So this patient has to be, you have to call the cath lab early morning and this patient actually presented at 2.30 in about one and a half hour went to the cath lab and put a stent in the LED and a stent in the RCA because of the lesion and that led to such a nice electrocardiogram. R waves, there are some R waves preserved in lead 2 and STs disappeared and of course with the long term medical therapy of these patients are equally important so that you can break that cycle of the subclinical disease. So these are the now final two slides. So put everything together. How do we do? What are our guidelines which keep on changing and I have updated these are our guidelines as of uh, uh, 2011. The patient with acute coronary syndrome comes in and actually the guidelines is very important that they are giving a lot of choices to the physician to tailor made according to the patient characteristics. They're not saying you have to give only the, the clopidogrel or presagular, so they're giving you various choices, but clearly have given us direction how we should manage these cases. Initial therapy, aspirin, of course, any three of them, clopidogrel, presagular, or ticagrelor, are all approved. Then give a choice of heparin or low molecular heparin, and in some cases you give direct thrombin inhibitor. Pentasaccharide, if patient is not going to the cath lab, then Fonda Perinox is preferred. Of course, you give beta blocker nitrate. Then you, you risk stratify your patient based on the TIMI risk score, which we did in all our three cases. That if they are high risk, or has been shown that if you are intermediate risk, male, because in the intermediate risk female apparently, they behave like more of a low risk, the so intermediate risk male and high risk, various factors, they should go to the cath lab. And the strategy is cath lab in 16 to 24 hours with 2B3 inhibitor or direct from an inhibitor. Other patients who are on the low risk, negative troponin, conservative strategy. Then what you do, they, you, we watch them for 24, 48 hours. If they have another chest pain or we do a stress test, if they are positive, they go to the cath lab. If they are negative, then you go home on the long term medical therapy of aspirin, antiplatelet therapy, statin beta blocker and ACE inhibitor. And that is the guideline at present. And purpose there is that we stab stabilization of the plaque to prevent in-hospital event and the intermediate and long-term event. The initial events are PCI with stenting with aggressive antithrombotic, antiplatelet, anticoagulants. And of course, then we treat them more aggressively for long-term systemic treatment with a reduced thrombogenicity in the blood, antiplatelet, reduced plaque content, decreased inflammation, improve endothelial function, increase plaque collagen content, so treat this patient. The subclinical of that iceberg, those risk factors are eliminated. Though not only the treatment, very important, the guidelines make emphasis on the risk factor modification. Well, these patients otherwise keep coming back as a revolving door so that this, once you have those aggressive treatment of the systemic, the acute plaque rupture does not take place and you prevent this cycle and improve the overall prognosis of the patient. Thank you very much. Coming to the clinical issues of atrial fibrillation. See, major concern in atrial fibrillation is uh, thromboembolism, systemic embolism and stroke. So ultimately our aim is to prevent that complication. And how to assess the risk? There is charge two score. I think all clinicians, all of us should remember this score. CHID is for each clinical condition. If patient has congestive heart failure, there is score 1, hypertension 1, age more than 75, 1, diabetes 1, and prior stroke or TIA, then 2. How to, what is the interpretation from this? According to this, if chart score is 0, then this patient has simple low atrial fibrillation with none of this risk factor, no hypertension, diabetes, then his uh, risk is very minimum of getting stroke per year.
and he can be left just on aspirin. So antiplatelet is enough. If your score is 1, if there is only one respecter of any of this, hypertension or diabetes or elderly fellow more than 75, then he may receive aspirin or warfarin. But if your score is more than 1, 2 to 6, then all these patients should be on warfarin to prevent or minimize the risk. So this is the basic thing. So all these following three trials are based on this. When we give aspirin, stroke risk, so stroke risk is reduced by 20%. If you combine with clopidogrel, risk is further reduced to 28%, but of course you get a little bit more bleeding. Warfarin is very effective at stroke prevention, but there are some issues with warfarin also. We know that there are drug and food interactions, there is narrow therapeutic range, there is need for monitoring, there is excess bleeding, and even if you get best INR reports regularly done, patient is very compliant, then also in the to the clinical practice, only 60% are at their target INR of 2 to 3. So is new molecule Epixaban, is factor 10A inhibitor useful for stroke prevention? We knew this molecule yesterday, we discussed this for SES, is a factor 10A inhibitor and is a competitive inhibitor. So Averos was a trial, multicenter randomized trial. More than 5,600 patients were there with atrial fibrillations who were unsuitable for vitamin K antagonists. Warfarin was not possible to give and they had more than one respector, one or more respector. It, it, so, so same thing, Charles risk score was there and mean age was 70. Epixabin 5 milligram BD was compared with aspirin 81 to 324 milligram per day and they were followed for one year. Primary endpoint was occurrence of stroke or systemic embolism and Charles 2 score was mean score was 2.1. So these are just uh, say moderate risk patient, not very low risk, very high risk. What was the effect? Epixabon was clearly superior in preventing stroke and systemic embolism. And that also, there was no excess bleeding with Epixabon. So that was a very good uh, result in patient with AF with risk score of, say more than one risk, uh, chart score of 2.1 means medium risk. Then Epixabin is clearly superior to aspirin and there is no excess bleeding. There is no, it is similar to aspirin. There is another trial, Aristotle. Here Epixabin is compared with warfarin, which is our current practice in a higher risk patient. So 18,000 patient, very large trial, very well conducted, age more than 75, with uh, prior stroke, heart ejection fraction less than 40, diabetes, hypertension, and age was uh, more than 70. So this, so one of the risk factors was there in this patient also. So Epic 7, same dose 5 mg BD was compared with warfarin with target INR of 2.3, 2 to 3, and they were followed for 1.8 years. Primary endpoint was same stroke or systemic embolism, and again chart score was same, 2.1. So again, these were intermediate risk person, not very high risk person. Again, Epic 7 was clearly superior to warfarin as far as primary endpoint is concerned, and even bleeding was less. So this was uh, both, on both ways it was a uh, far, far superior than warfarin. So message was that, that epixabin is clearly superior to warfarin. It reduces stroke and systemic embolism by 21%, reduces major bleeding by 31%, and reduces mortality, which is just border and significant 11%. Epixabin is effective. What about rivaroxaban? Again, another factor 10 inhibitor molecule. So we discussed yesterday the same thing, factor 10 inhibitor, direct competitive inhibitor. Wide, I mean, a lot of data is there. More than 25,000 patients are studied on this molecule. Rocket atrial fibrillation trial was there. Multicenter randomized. Again, a huge trial, 14,000 patients. But this was slightly higher risk patients. Patients were included if risk factors were two or more. So age more than 75, EF less than 75, diabetes, hypertension, and mean age also was 73. So this was higher risk patient than previously described two trials. If here, dose of rivaroxaban was slightly high, 20 mm per day, say 10 BD. In yesterday's SES cases, 2.5 BD or 5 BD was given. We have discussed this thing yesterday. And target warfarin was, uh, INR was 2 to 3, and follow-up was for almost two years. Primary endpoint was same. I mean, it was to determine non-inferiority to rivaroxaban for stroke or systemic embolism prevention. And CHARTS 2 score was 3.48. In previous two trial, it was 2.1. So this was clearly more higher risk of uh, population. And we see this in day-to-day -day practice. If you have is diabetic hypertension when more than 75 age, your risk is all automatically 3. So primary efficacy endpoint, rivaroxaban was non-inferior to warfarin, 
So it was effective molecule and bleeding risk was same. Rivaroxaban and warfarin, whether it's major bleeding or, or non-major bleeding, clinically relevant but non-major, bleeding risk was as comparable to warfarin. So message from this trial was that for moderate to high risk patients with atrial fibrillation, rivaroxaban was non inferior to warfarin for prevention of stroke or systemic embolism. And safety point of view, both were almost same, although there was slightly less ICH and fatal bleeding with rivaroxaban. So it was slightly better, and of course, you don't need to monitor INR. So that is the major advantage of uh, these newer molecules. So what we have learned from this trial, three trials. Epixaban was clearly better than aspirin in medium risk patient. There was significantly less bleeding. Epixaban was even better than warfarin for the same group of medium risk patient and significantly less event, significantly less bleeding, even marginally significant reduction in mortality also. So that was the result of Aristotle trial. So both were good news. And as far as rocket F trial is concerned, rivaroxaban was non-inferior to warfarin, so equal efficacy in very high risk patients. So it is good molecule, similar event, similar overall bleeding risk, less ICH and less plateau bleed. So that is also good news. And of course, you don't need to monitor INR in any of these uh, newer molecules. So that is the message at this stage. Another molecule in atrial fibrillation, last year we had discussed Athena trial, dronadaron, the new molecule like amadaron, has anti-adrenergic, anti arrhythmic effect, restores sinus, rhythm, restores sinus rhythm and actually maintains the sinus rhythm. And it reduces BP also. So basically, it is anti arrhythmic agent, which is given in recent onset AF in Athena trial. And we saw, we, it was shown that it reduces combined outcome of cardiovascular hospitalization and death, and reduces CV death, stroke, and arrhythmic death. So it was approved by even FDA for use in paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation. So, what about permanent AF? Paroxysmal AF means is a AF which is seen. Sometimes patient comes to sinus rhythm, persistent means in, you had seen patient with a sinus rhythm say before three months and now he is in AF, AF is continuous but it's not at least duration, you know that before three months he was in sinus rhythm so it's, it's not permanent AF, permanent AF means AF persistent or permanently there since last six months. So what about dronadoron, whether it can be effective in permanent AF means AF which is there continuously since more than six months. So that was, this, I mean, that question was answered in Pellas trial multi-center randomized 3,000 and more patients with age more than 65. AF was there since more than six months and at least one respect of a major vascular event was there. Age was more than 75 actually. Mean age, donated around 400 milligrams, same dose which was used in Athena was given here and uh, that was planned follow-up was for one year but it was stopped at 3.5 months only. Primary endpoint was composite of stroke, MI, systemic embolism or death from CV causes. Secondary outcome was unplanned hospitalization for a cardiovascular cause or death. What was the result? Dronadoron increased primary endpoint significantly. So it, it caused more stroke, systemic embolism, infarction or death. There was unplanned hospitalization that was or death significantly more with Dronadoron. So the trial was stopped in between at three months only and message from this trial was that among older patients with permanent AF and risk factor for a vascular event, this molecule is, has a significantly increased mass and should not be given. So this was due to increase in cardiovascular death, stroke and heart failure. So what we have learned from this trial? One should not give this molecule for permanent AF or if patient has heart failure. Now what about patients who, who are having intermittent AF and already you are giving donadoron? What should we do? Should we continue this? We can continue, but this patient should be closely followed. Every six months we should see that the patient is not going from intermittent AF into permanent AF. If it goes to permanent AF, you stop medical. These patients are prone to develop heart failure, and if heart failure is developed, then mortality is increased. So you should watch for heart uh, uh, patient's heart failure signs. And if heart failure is developed, you stop or discontinue the medication and look for QT prolongation. If QT is prolonged with this molecule, then stop it. And of course, you must give appropriate antithrombotic therapy before and throughout the use of donadoron because risk of stroke is increased with this molecule and particularly that is true for first two weeks of treatment. What about heart failure? See, acute decomposite heart failure, loop diuretics, all of us are using and they are part of, essential part of the treatment. How to use them? How, how, how many of you are using them twice a day, say like 80 milligram or 100 milligram twice a day IV bolus or same 200 milligram dose IV infusion. 
What is your choice? A or B? Pardon? Bolus regularly. Or continuous infusion of same 24 hour dose? Continuous infusion. Bolus, okay, fine. So we actually had no randomized trial for this also. So that was actually answered in dose trial. Multi center randomized trial, 2 by 2 factorial design. 300 patients with acute decompensated heart failure were there with mean age of 66. Fusemide, IV bolus, BID was given, and same dose was given as an infusion in a, another arm. Follow up was for 60 days. Primary endpoint was global assessment of symptoms at 72 hours and change in the serum creatinine level at the age, uh, from baseline to 72 hours. Now it was a 2 by 2 factorial design. So there are two, two doses for even fruzemide or equivalent of fruzemide, like uh, even bimetamide was used or tor torsemide was also used in equivalent dose. Low dose means the IV dose which was equal to pre-admission oral dose. And high dose was also given in both way, bolus as well as infusion. High dose was 2.5 times the pre-admission oral dose. So this was 2 by 2 factorial design. So four doses were there. Low dose bolus, low dose infusion, high dose bolus, high dose infusion. And average dose of furosemide was 128 to 134 million per day. What was the outcome? Net volume loss means diuresis was equal, whether you give bolus dose or infusion. Diuresis, weight, weight loss was equal, means diuresis, uh, amount of urine was same. But if you compare low dose versus high dose as expected, significantly more urine was there, more weight loss was there, with uh, high dose, that was expected. But what about uh, mean change in creatine level? Compared to bolus, if you give continuous infusion, there is more trend to increase creatine. In. And if you give higher dose compared to lower dose, then also you are likely to give, uh, raise the creatine further. Of course, this difference was not significant, but there was trend for increasing creatine level with high dose and with continuous infusion. Clinical composite endpoint of death, rehospitalization, or emergency visit, emergency room visit, both same. Continuous, you give continuously furosemide or bolus. Primary, I mean, this composite endpoint of death and hospitalization was same. If you give low dose or high dose, then also outcome was same. Clinical outcome was same. So, loop diuretic in acute di uh, decomposite heart failure for symptom improvement and rising creatinine. Bolus is equal to infusion. Low dose is equal to high dose. So many times in our ICUs, we continuously give infusion with the th or thought that uh, you have got infusion pump available, is easy to give, is it? But uh, theoretically, or by evidence-based medicine, whatever you like, you can give, there is no much difference. And if you give higher dose, or actually infusion inc increases creatine further, and if you give high dose, then also creatine rises further. So you may continue to do what you are doing, give bolus doses and give in low dose only. What about ischemic LV dysfunction? See, in our day-to-day -day clinical practice, we see many patients with uh, anterior MI, LV dysfunction, with some 90% lesion in LID. We don't know that scar is viable or no. And there is a lot of discussion. There are two other moderate vessel disease in LID, I mean circumflex and RCA, what to do? The assessment of myocardial viability may guide whether who will benefit by CABG, but how, however, the efficacy of this approach is uncertain. So this was studied in stitch viability arm. Um, stitch was a huge trial where surgery, surgical ventricular restoration was compared, CABG with surgical ventricular restoration was compared with CABG versus medical, uh, medical therapy alone. But in this sub subgroup, uh, I'll show you that more than 600 patients enrolled in stitch trial underwent assessment for myocardial viability. And all these patients had multivessel disease with ejection infection of less than 35, mean age was 59. So medical therapy plus CABG was compared with medical therapy. They were followed for 3.2 years, and primary endpoint was death from any cause. And of course, there are secondary endpoints also. And each and every patient of, uh, I mean, this patient was had uh, gone for myocardial viability study by uh, SPECT as well as Dobutamin ECO, and they assessed the viability. What was the result? Primary endpoint of all cause death was same, whether you give medical therapy or CABG, there is no difference. If you look for cardiovascular cause of death, then CABG was slightly better than medical therapy. If you look at death from cardiovascular causes or hospitalization, then also CABG was better than medical therapy, and then PVLV was significant. 
if you look at viability those who had viable myocardium and those who had no viable myocardium still patient had gone for CABG then after adjustment of baseline differences in multivariable analysis actually here the di uh, difference was significant but if you adjust them about uh, baseline variability then that whether patient had viable myocardium or no viable myocardium p value was same 0.21 so it doesn't make any difference if your patient has say anti rmi rd has 90% lesion and other two vessels are also disease you are scratching your head whether it's viable or no we do stress thallium or dobutamine eco somebody says viability somebody says no viable if it's viable you think of cabg non viable you think that let it medical therapy continue if you do that i mean only viable people will have better outcome so viability actually does not make any difference in your decision so message from this trial is that all cause death whether you do medical therapy or you go for cabg plus medical therapy all cause death is same demonstration of myocardial viability did not identify the patients with differential survival benefit from cabg in other words non viability does not mean no surgery especially if patient has significant cad so you should send the patient for CABG whether your viability is demonstrated or no provided patient has triple vessel disease and you if you do that your all cause death all cause mortality is not reduced but cardiovascular cause uh, cardiovascular mortality is reduced by CABG need for repeat or repeated hospitalization is also reduced by CABG so you can send your patient for uh, CABG even if your stress thallium is negative so that is the message from this trial because CIBG had lower uh, rates of death from cardiovascular causes and need for hospitalization. Just one minute, I can go for another thing, another last trial. Acute decompensated heart failure, major health problem. We know that Nesiretide is a recombinant beat natriuretic type of peptide, which was approved by FDA in 2001. Ten years ago, it was approved with a very small trial where only relief of dyspnea was demonstrated and FDA had approved for this molecule in 10 years ago when there was no long-term trial and for 10 years it is available in USA but it was it never came to India intermediately inter, I mean, intermittently these few papers came with Nesiretide that it increased renal toxicity and has some increased trend for mortality also so people were slightly scared to use even in USA so large randomized trial was needed and this was done as an SN HF trial multi-center randomized trial more than 7,000 patients with acute decompensated heart failure were treated with mean age was 67. Nesirator was given as an infusion, bolus followed by infusion, and this was compared with placebo. Follow up was for 30 days. Primary co primary endpoint was change in Disney at 6 and 24 hours, and composite of rehospitalization for heart failure or death within 30 days. All standard therapy were given in both the arms diuretic, morphine, inotropes, and other vasoactive medications like IV nitroglycerin, and everything was given equally in both arms. Just to one minute more. Median duration of study was around 41 hours. So, basically, study drug was given for 41 hours. What was the result? Self assessment change in dyspnea at 6 and 24 hours. Slightly better with. Uh, Nesiretide compared to placebo, p value was 0 0.03 year, 0 0.007 year. So, dyspnea was slightly better at 6 hours as well as 24 hours. But other heart clinical outcome, death or rehospitalization for heart failure, no different with Nesiretide, death was also same, need for rehospitalization was also same. So, message from the trial among patients with acute decompensated heart failure, Nesiretide was associated with mild improvement in dyspnea at 6 and 24 hours. Death and repeat hospital need were similar. Hypertension actually was more common. There is no increase in renal failure. Overall, Nesiretide, although it's FDA approved, 10 years back it was approved. There is no benefit, no harm. So it never came to India, and I'm sure it will never come to India. Okay, so what I'm going to do is make this a little bit fun uh, because you've probably had a chance to see some of the carotid data coming out over the years, but we've put this into top 10 points that I thought you should know about uh, the CREST trial, which is the latest da data on carotids. I had the privilege last year in January of presenting to the FDA panel in Washington, D.C., all of the data from the CREST trial, which then led to the FDA's subsequent approval of carotid stenting for patients who are at standard surgical risk as opposed to high surgical risk patients, standard surgical risk patients. And so that is now approved in the U.S. 
Unfortunately, in the United States, the, the reimbursement agency called CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, has not approved reimbursement for patients who are Medicare beneficiaries, and those are patients in the United States who are over age 65, to actually be reimbursed for the procedure. So therefore, the procedure has been limited to private insurance reimbursement in the United States. And I'm going back along with our staff from Abbott and a broad array of physicians from the societies in the United States to present to CMS a panel coming up in about three weeks uh, in Washington to go through the presentation again and hopefully achieve uh, ultimately this year approval, reimbursement approval in the United States for standard surgical risk patients to have carotid stenting. So I thought I would go through this. If you're interested, the full presentation can be found uh, of all the CREST data and what we presented last year at the FDA website, uh, which I think would be interesting uh, for you. If you'd like this, I'd be happy to give this to you. So if you look at the timeline of, of clinical trials, where we are today uh, with carotid data, these are the most important studies. Above the horizontal line are the trials in high surgical risk patients. These would be patients at high risk of, for carotid endarterectomy. And below the line are patients who are, would be at standard risk for carotid surgery. And the trials above the line uh, are numerous, large uh, volume of patients, both in randomized trials and also in large prospective registries, uh, showing that patients at high surgical risk can uh, do very well with carotid stenting. And these are uh, trials predominantly in the U.S., but some of them are international. Uh, for instance, the PROTECT trial has, uh, has enrolled some patients uh, internationally, um, uh, as well as the CHOICE trial. And then below the line are standard surgical risk uh, patient trials, most of which have been in Europe until the CREST trial, which is the largest prospective randomized trial comparing carotid stenting to carotid surgery in the world with over 2,500 patients, has now been published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, with the NIH analysis, and we'll be publishing the FDA regulatory analysis that I presented last January in circulation coming up here in the first quarter of this year. And then there is a trial ongoing in the United States called ACT-1, which is a randomized trial in asymptomatic patients, so patients who've never had a TIA or a stroke, randomized to either carotid stenting to, or carotid surgery with a two-to-one randomization ratio. And we're going to continue this trial. We want to finish it even though we may, uh, uh, of course, we already have uh, FDA approval for this indication because we feel like we need more data. Um, so what's the point number one? We're going to do top ten points that I think you should know about in terms of carotid stenting uh, versus surgery. And this is, um, what about the European studies versus the United States in terms of uh, carotid stenting outcomes? Point number one, why is there a difference in the European trials which seem to show that stenting was inferior to surgery versus the CREST trial which is a U.S. trial which shows non-inferiority. And the reason is, uh, I'll get into this, but let's take a look at the 30-day outcomes to start with. So 30-day death and stroke outcomes for the European trials, EVA3S, SPACE, ICSS, and then the U.S. trial, which is CREST. And you can see that for EVA3S, cried stenting was statistically inferior uh, with higher death and stroke 30-day uh, rates. For the SPACE trial, uh, it trended to be a little higher, but was not statistically different. ICSS showed a higher rate, and the CREST trial is the only one that has shown uh, non-inferiority. This was uh, in symptomatic patients, 5.4% versus 6.7%. Although it was higher, it was not statistically different and met the primary non-inferiority uh, for the primary endpoint. But the primary endpoint for CREST included myocardial infarction, not just death and stroke, which is a very important safety endpoint, as you'll see as we go through this discussion. Um, so why did these uh, differences show up? Well, one of the, the, the key differences was in training. Uh, for the European trials, for the most part, there was very little training required or previous experience required for carotid stenting. And therefore, the stent operators were not as experienced as the ones in the U.S. CREST trial. But the other was in the use of embolic protection. EPD stands for embolic protection. So these are the filters that are used during carotid stenting, which are very important. They were used in the EVA3S study. Um, they were only used in about half the patients in space. They were used uh, to some degree in ICSS, but it was mandated in CREST. So over 95% of patients in the CREST trial had embolic protection. And we've learned that this is very important to successful 
uh, reduction of stroke uh, risk during carotid stenting. In addition, the European trials did not ascertain the risk of myocardial infarction, which is an important periprocedural risk, of course, following carotid surgery, but not following carotid stenting. And then operator experience was uh, uh, almost, uh, almost nil for EVA 3S and ICSS. In space, it was required pretty good, pretty contemporary, and in Crest, it was very good. So there were big differences in the European trials and the U.S. trials which uh, FDA also agreed uh, strengthened the, the, the data that we uh, achieved with the CREST trial in the United States. So other potential confounders were in space, the trial was stopped prematurely, so this study has to be taken with a grain of salt there. Device-specific training uh, was really only mandated in the CREST trial. Uh, qualifying core laboratories were not consistent in the, in the European studies. And the DAPT regimens were also extremely variable in the European practice in those studies. In CREST, dual antiplatelet therapy was required, mandated, uh, for one month following the procedure. Now, what about point number two? What about the CREST NIH analysis versus the FDA analysis? Because the data that we presented to the FDA that led to support was slightly different type of analysis compared to the paper that you've seen in the New England Journal, which was the uh, National Institute of Health or the NIH analysis. And the point is that they're very consistent. But to show you the differences, the CREST FDA analysis was a one-year endpoint. The NIH analysis was a four-year endpoint of follow-up. The primary population for the FDA analysis was per protocol, so that means as the patient was treated compared to intention to treat analysis in the NIH. The primary endpoint was non-inferiority for the FDA analysis and was superiority for the, for the NIH analysis. And the number of patients, therefore, was somewhat different in the analysis because these were as treated, and this was intention to treat, which was all patients. And then the median follow-up was slightly different in the two trials, in the two analyses. This is all the same study, but using two different statistical analysis plans. And these were pre-specified when the study was started eight years before it was fully enrolled. Because remember, the CREST trial took eight years uh, to enroll, included both symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. But what did that mean? What did it show up? When you look at the two different analyses, how did they compare? Well, if you look at the NIH four-year primary endpoint intention to treat, ITT, versus the PMA uh, analysis for regulatory purposes for the FDA, with a one-year per protocol endpoint, you can see that the hazard ratios were almost identical for the two um, uh, procedures, and this is really the percent difference between casts and surgery, uh, as you can see here, almost identical, favoring surgery a little bit, so the rates were a little higher for carotid stenting versus surgery, but met the pre-specified margin of non-inferiority for both statistical analyses. So statistically, uh, these two procedures, stenting and surgery, were non-inferior to each other. Now point number three, or a question is, what about quality of life? for surgery versus carotid stenting, and particularly what we've learned from the trials. Well, if you look at the impact uh, of periprocedural events, a stroke or MI, on quality of life measured as an SF36 uh, tool, which is a questionnaire at one year, adjusting for uh, some baseline uh, risk factors that might be different, what you see that, if, of course, if a patient has a stroke, particularly a major stroke, they're going to have a, a, a statistically significant reduction and their physical and mental component uh, of quality of life. Minor stroke also showed that both the physical and mental components were slightly reduced compared to not having a minor stroke. And if you had a myocardial infarction, which was more common with the surgical endarterectomies, uh, it still um, looked like it impacted quality of life, but it was not statistically as significant. Because, as you know, most heart attacks, are, are, once you've had one, you don't really notice that you've had it as a patient unless you have a very large one and have heart failure symptoms. So this would make sense. But how did the two therapies compare if you compare uh, endarterectomy and stenting? And what you can see is that this is the, uh, over time, baseline two weeks, one month, and one year, the SF36 physical component summary. And you can see that, as you would expect, within the first month, surgery doesn't look as good because people have had incisions, they've got healing, they may have some neck hematomas, and quality of life physically always is lower for surgery compared to a less invasive procedure. But by the time you get out to one year, there was uh, no significant difference between stenting and surgery in the overall physical component of quality of life. 
So the surgical patients basically, by one year, kind of forgot about the pain, felt okay, and seemed to be pretty similar to the stented patients. And if you look at the mental component of the quality of life survey, same thing was true, a little bit worse with surgery early, but no difference by the time you got to one year. Now what about the fourth point, cranial nerve injury? What does that involve? Because as we know, this occurs with carotid surgery, endarterectomy. And what about excess site complications requiring treatment? How do they compare between stenting and surgery? Well, what, you can, what we know, of course, from previous trials, from the NASA trial, which was a big trial of surgery versus uh, medical therapy in patients with carotid stenosis dating back in the, to the 90s, is that there was a 9% incidence of wound complications, 8.6% incidence of cranial nerve palsy, 8.1% 30-day medical complication rate, much of, much of which was due to prolonged hospitalization, and then a restenosis rate of 5 to 10% from the ACAST trials. So in these studies which date back into the 90s and early 2000s, we know from surgery that these complications occur. But what about in a randomized trial compared to stenting? These were compared to medical therapy. Well, the CREST trial, which we've been talking about, directly compared stenting to endarterectomy surgery, looked at this, and what they found was that with stenting, of course, there was no risk of cranial nerve injury. None of the patients uh, suffered it. However, with surgery, not only procedure-related, one month, and then this last line is unresolved at six months, 2.1% of patients still had cr residual cranial nerve injury at six months following the uh, endarterectomy procedure. That was 25 patients. 20 of those 25 patients had motor deficits. So these are not just mild sensory deficits. The vast majority, 80% of them, were motor deficits. So this is almost in some way like having a minor stroke, but it's not counted as a minor stroke. It's called cranial nerve injury. But of course, it is exclusive to the surgical group with none happening in the stented arm. Now, if you look at excess site complications, the same thing can be seen because surgery is just more invasive. And the primary difference in excess site complications that require treatment, this meant either transfusion, going back to the OR, or some uh, procedure, 20 surgical patients required it, only five uh, stented patients, which was statistically significant. And most of this was due to hematoma, but there were also differences in infection rates with infection being exclusive to the surgical group with no infections in the stenting arm. And then a, a whole group of miscellaneous other access site complications that had to be managed like transfusions, but maybe not with hematoma and other things like nerve compression that have to be included as well. And, uh, and when you add it up, basically surgery is more invasive and it was highly statistically significant, 3.7% versus 1.1%. Uh, for stenting. Now point number five is what about asymptomatic patients? I think most people agree that a patient that's had a TIA or a stroke needs to have something done if they have a 70% stenosis by angio or, 50, or a 70% by duplex ultrasound or 50, at least 50 or 60% by angiography. But the question is if they're asymptomatic, how does that fare uh, between stenting and surgery? <clears throat> And what the CREST trial showed is that whether you had symptoms or not, there was no statistical difference. The confidence intervals overlapped for the event rates for both groups of patients. And these are the asymptomatic patients. Remember, this is the primary endpoint, which is death, stroke, and MI. So it's going to be a little higher than the death and stroke rate by itself. But that's what the primary endpoint included. And you can see in asymptomatic patients, there was really no difference between the two. And although symptomatic were higher, there was no difference. And then in the elderly, it didn't make any difference either. non octogenarians and octogenarians fared pretty similarly. So this is important to understand. And then if you look at the outcomes for asymptomatic high surgical risk patients, which we have from the large volume of data, not CREST data, but from the post-market uh, large registries, which has never been demonstrated by endarterectomy in this population because these are high surgical risk patients that are asymptomatic the event rate, death and stroke rate, is well below the AHA guideline, or well within it, at 2.9%. Death and major stroke of 1.1%, only 0.8% death. And so these, these data are very acceptable when you look at the very large amount of data that we have out there on asymptomatic patients, and even the high-risk asymptomatic patients. Now, what about the use of embolic protection? I made a point of it earlier that that seemed to make a difference, and it definitely did. If you take a look at the primary endpoint rate, for the overall trial without embolic, with, with the overall study, including patients who did not have embolic protection, and then look at 
patients who only had embolic protection with the AccuNet, you can see that now the difference between stenting and surgery becomes no difference with the composite endpoint being 6.6% in both arms for patients who all had embolic protection. So this points out how important it is to use an embolic protection device, which was not used in the majority of the European studies. And then the, the next point is minor strokes, because clearly there were more minor strokes in the CREST trial uh, for stenting compared to surgery. Now these differences were relatively small, but you can see here uh, that the, uh, the difference for any stroke was statistically significant. That was driven predominantly by the difference in minor stroke, by, not by major stroke, whereas MI was more common with surgery. So how did these balance out? What is the risk-benefit sort of analysis for more strokes occurring, minor strokes, with stenting, but more heart attacks occurring with surgery? Well, let's attack the, the minor stroke issue first. What happened to those patients? Well, here's what happened to them. These are the residual neurological deficits by modified Rankin. It's a very sensitive uh, score for disability assessment for patients who either had surgery in the blue or stenting in the orange. And as was shown acutely at one month, there were more stent patients, 1.2% versus 0.5% of the overall population that had some disability after the procedure that they did not have before they had the procedure. But look at what happens by six months. By six months, this difference is reduced to only 0.3% for the overall population. Both procedures looking extremely safe because both surgery and stenting, stenting and surgery showed less than 1% residual disability from a minor stroke for patients who had minor stroke uh, peri procedures. So both these procedure, uh, procedures are actually very safe and what's interesting is very comparable with this difference early on starting to disappear by six months. Now, what about periprocedural MI? I mentioned that there were more MIs in the surgical arm, and you can see here that was statistically significant for the CREST trial. And the reason this is important is because is if you're an interventional cardiologist, you've been following this for a while, periprocedural MI is associated with late mortality. Well, was that true in the CREST trial? Absolutely. And this was very impressive data that we presented to the FDA last year, which shows that if, if you're in the CREST trial, and you had a, an MI, a periprocedural MI, and there were 56 patients who had an MI, you can look at the mortality out to four years here compared to patients who had a minor stroke or had uh, neither, so a patient that had neither. And what you can see is that if you had a minor stroke, it had really no impact on your mortality. But if you had a periprocedural MI, it was highly associated with mortality, and as you know, this occurred more frequently in the surgical arm than in the endarterectomy arm, uh, in the surgery arm compared to stenting. So MI is an important component of an endpoint, and there's debate about this with vascular surgeons as to whether you should include MI in a carotid study. But we, of course, include stroke in our coronary studies, so it's very important to include stroke in coronary studies and to include MI in carotid studies so you, you totally encapsulate all the important safety events that could occur after these procedures that can be associated with late events. And then what about age? Maybe older patients, we shouldn't be doing stenting. So we actually did this, the FDA had us do this, and looked at the hazard ratios across uh, the board for age and the elderly patients. You can see that even the patients over 80, of which there were 200, no uh, hazard risk uh, that increased at all for stenting or versus surgery. And then finally, there's a learning curve here, which is important to understand that during the course of the CREST trial, the event rates were coming down. Patients were doing better because we were learning. It was a procedure in evolution, and today the event rates in these later large prospective registries are much lower than they were uh, in the beginning of, uh, of the carotid experience in the early 2000s, and this is during the period of time that CREST was performed. So you can see that with CREST, the risk of death or any stroke goes down every single uh, year during the CREST trial, such as in the last year, only 1.8% in the last year. So in order to try to finish on time, I'm going to speed ahead to the conclusions, which are that basically endarterectomy as a procedure has increased in volume, and as it increased in volume, the complication rates have gone down since the 1950s. Surgery's very mature for carotid disease. It's been around for 50-plus years. But with stenting, we're just in this era. We just started in the late 90s and in the 2000s with increase in volumes and decreasing complications, as you've seen. And this is during the time period that the CREST trial and these trials were done. So we feel like, obviously, that the rates are much better today than they were when we started these studies. So in the final reckoning, if you compare surgery 
to carotid stenting for carotid disease in, in the properly indicated patients, the death stroke and MI risk is identical, the long-term outcomes are identical, but where the differences are is the patient has a higher risk for cranial nerve injury and excess site complications if they have an operation. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much.